debate, especially in this, in this, you know, like contemporary world, is uh, the well, the debate will help people to think what is the right and what's the wrong. And especially right now, so many people don't have the ability to differentiate what is the right thing and what the wrong thing and many people have false belief and that bring suffering all the time and so that's why what i see the most important the value is the debate is uh, you know the people will get the ability to differentiate which one is right and which one is wrong especially right now there's so many like destruction incident news and false news fake news and so that's why if you don't have the ability to differentiate so this will lead you in the negative side and then gradually it will bring to you lots of regret and then the regret will destroy your ease and happy day to day life so and uh, one thing it helped to keep the idea or the thought very deeply because uh, when you get the uh, meaning through arguing right through arguing and through finding reason and then people can keep the meaning or the knowledge more like uh, how how to i how can i say it's more like a uh, stable stable right is sometimes we learn today and tomorrow is gone and day after tomorrow is gone because it's not in the deep in the brain so if you learn through debate then it will bring you know in the deep level of the memory so that's why it also helped to keep those knowledge very deeply and then this this knowledge we can affect on your behavior and uh, everything, I think I can say. So this is uh, through my experience is a very useful tool to in the class mm -hmm. and not only for the science, right? And also for the English. Mm -hmm. And uh, when for improving English, when we set up some topic and then made a group and then let them debate through more like a logical and then also this is very useful mm -hmm. yes so yeah i i myself is uh, i love too much about debate and then i always inspiring my student or some other women and when i you know see something someone and uh, whenever they ask me you know how to find the purpose of life and i always urging them to study the debate studying the debate why why right why the debate is so important so what i have seen is many people many people in this world they are making and uh, I think I can say it's bringing too much trouble in their life through false belief. Mm -hmm. Through false belief. Then how, so the, in terms of seeking and happiness life, happy life, you have to read of all this false belief. How can, how can you read of all this false belief? through your logical study, right? Through your logical education. And especially be a nun, right? Be a nun. And many nuns are disrupting. Why? So did the most nun who are disrupting is, uh, they, they, they don't have, I have seen is a lack of logical education. Because if they don't have logical education, they couldn't see which one is correct and which one is not correct. Mm -hmm. And when you have the ability to differentiate which one is correct and which one is right, and then it will bring 
more joy to your life, what you are doing right now and in the future and uh, what you did in the past. And then it make you happy and it will make you, I think, let you pursue it, you know, right, left, you know, rest of the thing, what you wanted to do. And also it help to people get on the track, you know, which, uh, which, which pretty much related with what you wish you, uh, your or people's vision, right? Vision or mission. So many people, they have mission, right? I wanted to do this one, this one, this one, then they set up too much mission and or vision. Mm -hmm. And when on the day to day life, they are off track from this vision. So the logic study will let you think and uh, especially who you are and what you are doing and what, uh, you know, how you are spending your time. So those questions will bring you on the track and then you can achieve whatever goal you have, right? Is uh, not for one day or two days, but uh, it will help bring you back on the, you know, like on track and it will bring joy to you. So I think this, that's why I'm talking people, you know, like whenever people ask me, I'm not talking them all oh, practice this one, this one, I am talking them, please will study logic. <laughs> if you have the logic study, you can find out which, what way, you know, what kind of practice you can do and you suit to you and uh, you can find your own way to practice, don't need to, to ask to someone and obey to someone mm -hmm. and rely on someone, right? Different uh, intellectual tradition uh, uh, have understood what the uh, intellectual work is, but I think uh, this tradition has some special uh, emphasize some particular point which are uh, very interesting, which is really the art of questioning. Mm -hmm. Because in debate you're forced, when you debate, when you stand up and you debate somebody, you're forced to see, to look for what's questionable in the uh, adversary, the, of the partner, let's say. Uh, position. And so uh, that's something which is uh, especially interesting, which is that you learn through the year kind of a, uh, to develop this habit uh, uh, to question anything you, uh, uh, any statement you're faced with. And uh, in Tibetan culture, this uh, uh, quality is often caricatured about geishas debating uh, old ladies and so on. But uh, <laughs> this is this is a special feature uh, of this uh, of this tradition. I don't think it's unique. Uh, I think, uh, for example, when I went to universities, uh, my uh, uh, professor of philosophy immediately recognized me as, you know, I am a ph Buddhist philosopher and I am trained like, basically like they were trained. And we, they, this is, uh, so I don't think it's uh, uh, intellectual training is, is unique to the Tibetan tradition, but this emphasizes non-questioning mm. is really interesting and is a unique uh, feature which obviously, as I argue in my book, I suggest that it might be connected to the Madhyamika uh, idea, but uh, that's obviously uh, a speculation on my part. Yes, you said that the mind can increase infinitely in terms of its potential. So not only is there, uh, does it have, this what I say about not needing to use effort to get to the same level. But so, so the counter example Dharmakirti gave to this for the counter example for the effort was jumping. 
The counterexample for having a no limit is, is boiling water. So Dharmakirti said that if I boil water, if I, so if I heat water, at a certain point the water, water will boil and turn to steam and disappear. You can't, can't just keep heating in, in, uh, infinitely, exponentially. At a certain point it will just boil off. Uh, but the mind is not like that. If I keep increasing compassion, and we consider compassion as like heating the mind, it's not that the mind will just ex explode. Uh, it can just keep increasing and increasing and getting sharper and sharper. Uh, this is a part of Dharmakirti's reasoning, trying to establish why it's possible to achieve what we call liberation and enlightenment, that the qualities of the mind can keep being developed, even though this might seem extraordinary or supernatural to some people, because it's not something we see, it's extremely rare. But maybe there are some people who develop their mind to an extraordinary extent, far, far beyond what most of us think is possible. Just like uh, some of us might be very amazed when we see professional athletes, if we've never seen them before. Uh, but that the, the degree to which a professional athlete excels beyond an ordinary person uh, is not exponential. It's usually um, you know, significantly more, but not something we could say almost seem like superhuman. But Dharmakirti argues that with the mind it's different. It's very possible to train the mind to an extraordinary level. So what we're doing in debate is starting that. We're starting this process of training the mind. So in terms of how could I, how could this be used in today's world, I think, as I said, uh, I, I find that my mind is much sharper than it was when I was in college, and I wish I had this level of focus and ability to think clearly as I when I was in college, because I would have gotten a lot more out of it. Um, you know, I think if I had used debate uh, to um, in, in the subjects I was learning in college, it would have helped tremendously in science, in math, in history, philosophy, all of these things. If I had used debate as a tool, it would have really helped me uh, to uh, to understand more clearly, also to remember it. A lot of the things I learned in college, you know, I did study quantum mechanics a little bit in college just to get some idea of what was going on, but I don't remember what I studied. When I want to learn quantum mechanics now, I have to read it again. Um, because even though I, I, was, I did okay on the exam, I, by the time the exam was over, a few months later, I just forgot the main points. Whereas if we debate something, uh, it really stays in mind because we're forced to speak it out loud, to go through it again and again, and you have to ask, be, learn to both to be asked questions and learn which questions to ask. This is actually the most important thing. Sometimes we don't recognize that there's some question to be asked. It just seems, okay, this is all straightforward, I accept it. But we have to learn to check, well, really, is this so clear? Maybe there's some important question to ask about this. So if I had had that opportunity, not to mention um, what value does this have in the contemporary world? You know, I think one has to distinguish between two types of debate. One is debate in general, that is the idea of a dialogue between two people, a critical dialogue in which questions are raised and um, people are expected to give reasons for why they make certain claims. And the specific form of debate that's practiced in the Tibetan academies in the dansas. Um, so obviously the, um, the form, the, the more general form of debate that, that is critical dialogue where people are, each, each participant in the dialogue is committed to giving reasons for the claims that they make and the idea of sustaining this dialogue to try and get greater and greater depth about a question, that obviously has tremendous value. And in the West, there are also um, forms of debate. I mean, there are debate societies and in high school and in college, and there are groups that 
that engage in this type of debate, a kind of formal formal debate. But you know, there there's also a debate in a more general way where people sometimes even on the on news channels will debate a certain issue. So that we can call the kind of more general form of debate. And there's obviously a great deal of value to that. It's not simply people stating their views, it's stating their views through uh, reasoned argument, giving reasons for why they believe what they believe. And then someone else responding and assessing whether reasons are good reasons and so forth. Um, the form of debate that's practiced in the Tibetan monastic tradition is quite different from that. Um, I mean, obviously it has in common with that more general form of debate, um, a commitment to reasoned argumentation following certain rules and procedures. But I think that it has become over time and you know, getting back to the historical question of Nalanda, um, from what we know, it seems that it probably began um, at the monastery of Sangpu um, under people like uh, Mok London Sherab or his successors in around the 12th century. Around that, around this time. Um, so it's evolved in a very specific way, and one of the things that make particularly useful study of philosophical texts, Tibetan philosophical texts, is the fact that um, it has evolved to be able to condense complex positions uh, into um, very short, uh, pithy answers and responses that allows an argument to move forward quickly and therefore to gain greater depth um, quickly. So, um, the specific rules that govern Tibetan debate, I think we don't find in the more general form of debate. Um, Your questions are great, but they're, 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 I mean, I can go on for hours and hours. So I'm gonna try to keep it short and maybe tell you a little bit of my background before I jump into it. So in the last few years, I've been um, <clears throat> training teachers and, and teaching kids social emotional learning. So this understanding, um, you know, our emotions, you know, His Holiness sometimes refers to the map of emotion, like trying to see what's going on for us. And also <clears throat> how do we uh, develop healthy relationships with ourselves, with others, and the world around us. Yeah. And um, for this, I use a framework uh, in social emotional learning with six components. I'm not gonna <laughs> show it to you just yet. How is debating important? Well, when you come to uh, developing skills of understanding your the world around you, the interdependence and um, but most specifically critical thinking. So debating really helps you develop this critical thinking, observing something, being able to see different angles, analyzing, and then coming up with either, you know, an answer or solution, or, you know, what can you do with this pro problem? So for me, this is a, it's highly important. Uh, it, it relates to the social emotional learning skills of that what we call we have three domains okay and well maybe I'll show you now actually mm -hmm. let's jump on this now because it will make more sense <clears throat> I think this is my desktop yep okay so so this is it so when we talk about social emotional learning so the, the CASEL which is the collaborative for academic social and emotional learning in the United States came up with five competencies and if you develop them 
you know, the outcome of being a happy, healthy uh, adult that thrives well, as in, in life is uh, achieved by this. We took all these competencies and put them in three domains because they're very tricky. Like, what are these competencies? It was quite confusing, you know, and but when we were working with my, you know, my, my team and I were like, actually it goes to three domains that the competencies that relate to the me domain, stuff that belongs to me, my self-awareness, able, being able to manage my emotion, so self-regulation. The you domain, so this is social awareness, being aware of others, and then the relationship skills and the us domain. Now here in the us domain, the classic cell people only have one competency that's called making responsible decision. And we thought, okay, there's something missing. And we added a competency before that called appreciating interdependence. So now each domain has a competency that involves awareness, self-awareness, social awareness, awareness of independence, and an action component, which is if I'm self-aware, do I, what do I do with my emotion? If I'm aware of you and the others, what do I do with my relationship skill? If I'm aware of interdependence, how do I make responsible decision-making? Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> so to answer your, uh, your question, for me, debating goes into the us domain. <laughs> it's a high powered us domain uh, practice because debating really, you, you really need to be able to understand how things interact, how they work together, you question them. Mm -hmm. And it's in a way, uh, it's, it's like playing chess at a high level, you understand the 10 steps ahead, not just mm -hmm. what's happening here. So if you teach debating to small kids, it's pretty much, you know, the, the connection is like, this is something and what's immediately happening. But as you practice debating and you get to a very advanced level, you understand 10, 20 steps ahead mm -hmm. what, you know, the direction you're taking as you're debating. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's a fantastic practice for this, but it still is connected, you know, because you, when you asked me to, to do this interview, I was like, does that relate to what I do at school? I never really asked myself this question, but actually it does because for me, if you look at this framework in the us domain, if I practice debating and I'm developing my critical thinking, I'm understanding the interconnection of things. It helps me make, you know, some uh, decisions. It's also highly connected to the me domain, you know, mm -hmm. and the you domain too, you know, to, to engage in debating at a basic level, you need to be very self-aware mm -hmm. and regulated as you do it with other people you need to be self-aware and you need to know yourself and you know as you go into the process also your own personality shines through in a way so yeah. this is uh this is what came up for me <laughs> so on a practical level on a day to you know again you know if you're if you've been debating a lot and you, if I'm always going to bring it back to this process. So if, if you're used to this process, it will come to you more naturally. So then in a day to day interactions, you can recall this process much faster mm -hmm. or think this could be useful. What could I do here? Should I do this or that? It's, mm -hmm. it's a bit like also an info. Um, it's, it's like a, an advanced, um, sorry, I'm Franglishing to them thinking in French, but it's, uh, you know, it's, um, it's a language, a computer language, you know, where you have mm -hmm. the tree and the branches, you know, so yeah. if you, if you play there and you know, if I go here, I got two choices, if I go there, da, 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 you, you get faster at this. And then I think it really helps you see and make decisions quicker mm -hmm. and connect your intentions faster. So for me, it's, it's a whole process that the more you practice, the faster it will be actually part of your life. It would be great to ask a, a very advanced debaters how they do it in everyday life and how they recall mm -hmm. their experience. I'm sure they don't really think twice. It's something in them. It's, it's integrated and right away they think, and they can see many, many mm -hmm. situation, situation and they make choices quite quick. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a form, you know what it's, it's for me, it's almost <laughs> now that we talk about this, it could be almost a, a kind of a, it's a practice, mm -hmm. um, it's a contemplative, a form of contemplative practice in a way in action mm -hmm. there are not many contemplative and action practices i mean there's compassion 
mm-hmm. uh, for me, there's the emotional literacy. You know, we, we practice feelings and needs. We have cards mm-hmm. and probably the art of debating mm-hmm. <laughs> when you integrate it at a certain level becomes some kind of practice and action, a form of practice and action. I, for example, if I have to answer and defend uh, the points that he was actually asking me, so I have, if I have to say something before saying that thing, I have to actually think twice in my mind whether if I say this, is there any forces uh, that are going to come? Is there any counter debate that he may bring to defeat my standpoint? So in this way, but there is no time for you to uh, you cannot say like, I need a few minutes to think and give an answer. So you have to answer instantly. You have to debate. You have to ask the questions instantly. So your answers and your thoughts, so they all have to be spontaneous. So the point that I'm trying to prove here is that personally, I feel uh, that when you study something, you never actually forget it. It's actually store in your memory forever so that's how we become the omniscient Mm. what happened is you're not able to recollect it Mm. at that time so that's what we call we forget it actually you don't forget it is in science you store in some part of your brain in buddhist language is still in your memory because once you do something you leave an imprint as a physical imprint you also leave an uh, imprint on your memory which stays forever so what it does is the uh, one, uh, what should I say? One, um, one lacking point that we humans on a beginners have is that we cannot do multitasking sometimes. When you think on a particular subject, you are not able to concentrate on a, another topic at the same time. So when you try to do that, you lose the focus of that one. Mm-hmm. So debate actually trains you to think multiple things at the same time, that too with precisions and to perfect. Mm -hmm. So that's why whatever you have studied before and when when you debate and when you answer, so the spontaneous arising of your memory actually helps you to pick from here and there those things that you have been studying so long before or you haven't actually prepared at all before coming to debate. What happens is sometimes you prepare something for debate, you end up debating something entirely different. Mm-hmm. So that very uh, occasionally happened to all of us. So this kind of uh, style, this style of debates and actually gives, what should I say, extra power to your brain and your memory mm-hmm. to remember, to recollect instantly mm-hmm. the different things that you have learned before. and say something about rhetoric. I was attending a PhD defense, and I say attending because it was not of one of my students, but it was in the field of Tibetan Buddhism. And uh, the title of his defense of his PhD dissertation had the word rhetoric in it. And uh, he had someone from the English department there. And the professor from the English department said one of the first things he teaches his new students, and you could imagine that to be his first year English students, is that rhetoric has its main goal, the is something like the presentation of the truth. And I immediately thought that makes great sense. The communication of the truth. Techniques for the communication of the truth. Now, here I began, it was almost as if I was couching debate as a way to defend against the presentation of lies. Mm. Exaggerated, omnipresent lies. 
about economic systems and political systems. But the background of what I was saying is learning how to be skeptical about them. In other words, there are facts, there is truth. And instead of gullibly being carried away by what the, you know, corporations or even tiny garages, you know, your car garages down the street are advertising, one needs always to have a skeptical view. And as the Dalai Lama has said, faith and skepticism in Buddhism go together, go together. So how do you become skeptical? You put yourself in situations where you have to face what is being skept said to you in a skeptical way, with a skeptical mind that examines. That doesn't be in a situation where you're not just carried away by emotion. And the way debate is done in Tibetan Buddhism, you have someone you yourself, if you're the, shall I even say, attacker, because attack isn't, isn't a bad word to use here. Someone who's yelling at you and slapping their hands together and looking at you as if you're a freaking idiot. And so you get used to that. You get used to that. And you get used to using your, your full voice, whether you're answering you don't have to use your full voice all the time, but you get used to modulating your voice through its full range, you know, which could be screaming. When I, I have not um, debated in the debating courtyard much. It was just a few months in Dharamsala in the School of Dialectics. And because I had a lot of background and knew how to debate, I was put in the uh, middle way school class, the, well, I won't use Tibetan, uh, middle way school class. And, um, you know, I was full throatedly developing, well, from the first day. And, um, uh, and Indians, you know, there's a lot of Indians out there as tourists. And a couple of them walking by one day and were sc scolding, <laughs> scolding us for being so horribly angry. <laughs> and one really couldn't say to them, no, no, we're not angry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you almost couldn't explain it to 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 someone who wasn't familiar with the technique. Um, but it, yeah, I don't know if it gets you over stage fright. In it certainly gets you. You know, when you have to give a lecture, it might be different, mm -hmm. even if you're used to. To scre screaming at at others in a group because there there is a even if you're debating against one person you are there's a group of people there even if you're used to that I suppose you you um, you still could have some stage fright if you have to give a lecture so. Um, Part of what I'm saying is it helps you develop social skills, mm -hmm. uh, both in, so one is internal development, internal development. And uh, I think very importantly, uh, it's very important to know that debate is part of rhetoric. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, this is something I didn't know about. Here I was, however old I was at that time, 40 or 50, and I didn't know what rhetoric was. I was learning as much as the PhD student was, and immediately I thought, that's true. And so maybe some people wouldn't want to learn debate um, because they would think, well, this is just showing off or it's trying to fool people or your, your learning skills so that you could um, fool people into accepting anything. Mm -hmm. And that would be a misuse of the skills you learn. Yeah, I think it's very, very um, valuable, especially if you apply it to the, you know, like our debate topic is not only external things, in inner, the, you know, values, what your mind is going on, how to control to the, your mind, where, you know, taking to your perspective to the, in the outside. So in that sense, Sometimes in our busy world, people forget about to think about what you who are who really you are, what you are thinking right now, moment right now. So they sometimes completely forget because they just focus on the too much for the outside, in the competition. Especially people <clears throat> like student and uh, you know businessmen, so much competitive lives. So then they always see, see what other people have. They don't, you know, focus on the what you have in your own values. So using one of the, our debate is not only debate to the and you know um, person A and B, and sometimes you know that's debate technique to use to how to develop our own mind, how to introspect our own mind and it tends to slow down. So in that sense, it's very important to cultivate your own, your inner value to promote, how to, you know, uh, calm your own, so how to control your emotions. So something like that. So in, in that sense, it's very, very important to the, um, I think, modern society life too. Like normally, regular people, when we called to the meditations, they usually think about like quiet and just, you know, focus on the single object and then just you just calm down there. And so in in what we, our system, we call the there's two, deep, you know, meditations, single point meditations, analytical meditations. Analytical meditations are very close to relate to the debate, which is the, you have to think about reason and the sharp as much as possible so sometimes you you know one single person's not you there's a certain limitations sometimes when you own think about using reasons you cannot reach much more higher then you use your partner to talk with the you know sharing to the knowledges and then sometimes you will get knowledge from other peoples and at the same time sometimes emergent some other new knowledges come up it, the world we are, you know, talking or debating. Two advantages happening. One is it's really uh, absorbed in your mind the meaning of topic, and also that keeps last long in your memory. Nowadays, one of the big problem in the Western, you know, the student is they have a really um, kind of problem for the memory mm -hmm. because they they are not memorizing. And then, you know, sometimes, you know, uh, some topics need to be keep last long in your mind. So in when we are debating, it's very strongly involved to the, you know, uh, connection person to defender and the um, often offense. And then that makes some sort of very kind of deeply absorbed in your mind that will last long. So that's kind of beneficial and also very deeply absorb the topic in the real to the your mind that is stick for last long. So that sort of thing is um, and also they have a lot of fun part 
you know, mm -hmm. sort of people doing playing each other. So that's a lot of fun part too, which is uh, kind of maybe beneficial for them, sort of like a happy time or break time, something like that. So it's a, I think it's a will be beneficial.